subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services examination perspective. Today we will be discussing the important news which has appeared in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 13th October 2022 and today's news will be discussed by Nagendra sir and me. These are the list of the news for today's discussion and the timestamp has also been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from UPSC Prelims and Mains perspective. Today is Thursday and this is your weekly Mains answer writing practice from DNS lectures. Now the question for this week is, India, despite being one of the water rich countries, still faces issues in its clean drinking water supplies. Examine the performance of Jal Jeevan mission in this regard. And this question needs to be answered in 150 words and hence carries 10 marks. Now to answer this particular question, you can go through the DNS of 4th October 2022 where Gaurav sir explained in detail about India's water situation and also Jal Jeevan mission through the editorial titled Every Drop Counts. And in this editorial, he explained in detail issues regarding the Jal Jeevan mission. So to answer this question, you can go through the DNS of 4th October 2022. With this, let's begin our today's discussion. Page number 9 of today's newspaper presents an item which talks about forest-led COP27. Now this topic is important more from the perspective of General Studies Paper 3 and will come under the subject of environment. As a subtopic, it will come under conservation, environmental pollution and degradation and environment impact assessment. Now, whenever we talk about COP27, we know that it is a continuing agenda and it has actually developed over COP26, which happened in Glasgow last year. Now, in this context, what we need to know that when we are talking about, say, forest-led COP27, so we need to understand what is the need for that. Now, in this context, let's understand the outcome of COP26, which happened last year. Now, whenever we talk about the major outcomes of COP26 that, is, that happened in Glasgow, we need to actually highlight four important points. The first is mitigation aspect in which the conference secured near global net zero NDCs that is nationally determined contributions from 153 countries and future of strengthening of mitigation measures. Now, whenever we talk about these mitigation measures, they were primarily based on technology. Now, when we talk about the mitigation, the mitigation that we are looking for is primarily based on science and technology, means the kind of climate change that has happened, we want to reverse the cycle using technology. Now, in this context, this is to an extent very difficult, which is highlighted by authors as well. And in this context, they highlight few simple points. First and foremost, they talk about the contributions from the countries in which these countries have committed that they will be producing electricities which will be non-emitting in nature. In order to simplify what non-emitting means, it means that they will be producing electricity which is based either on hydro, solar or maybe nuclear as well. So they will not be using conventional resources to basically produce electricity. But the kind of non-emitting electricity that we require to basically reverse the process of climate change, this is something that is not happening right now. Authors have very clearly highlighted that right now the kind of uh, non-emitting electricity that we are producing is somewhere around 4 kilowatt per hour per person and this has to be actually at this at the level of around 32 kilowatt hour per person very soon if you want to achieve something substantial from this entire process. The second important aspect of COP26 was adoption and loss and damage which actually boosted the efforts to deal with climate impact. Now here there are multiple aspects that we need to understand. First and foremost, when we talk about carbon capture and storage or biomass, we need to understand the way we are doing it right now. We are doing a carbon capture of around 6 kg per person per year. But at the same time, the requirement is somewhere 3600 kg 
per person per year now this again is something which is substantial and it is not easily possible to achieve this kind of a target in a very short span of time so the second important aspect the kind of outcome that we generated is again going to be in trouble third important aspect is basically talking about financing in which we are going to mobilize billions and actually trillions of dollars to basically fight climate change now here in this context the kind of commitments that we have seen is actually very high but the realization of these commitments is very low when we talk about the cop 26 one of the accepted aspect of financing was to generate around us dollar 1 trillion for financing actions which will lead to reversing the climate change in this entire journey but right now we are far away from the particular target so this is something which again is not happening in that sense fourth important aspect which came out of glasgow was collaboration in which it was talked about that governments and civil society and international community will be working to work together to deliver the kind of goods which will lead to climate change reversal approach now when we talk about this entire process of collaboration with civil society scientists scientific community and everything everything appears to be vague because there are no clear cut targets and hence there cannot be any kind of realization expectation from this entire process so when we look at that cop 26 glasgow conference we need to understand simple aspect first and foremost the problem that we can highlight is that it is too technology centric and hence it is bound to fail because the kind of technological addition that we have seen in the recent past is not going to reverse climate change and hence what is going to happen these ambitious targets are not going to get achieved and this is almost an impossible feat and hence the authors are suggesting that we need to change our approach from the technology centric approach to forest led approach now moving forward and try to understand what are the benefits of forest led approach the main agenda of forest centric approach is basically to develop a policy which is going to help us in terms of realization of our goals for climate change now in this context the first reason for taking forest centric approach is that forests are basically home to 80% of terrestrial wildlife now if we are not paying attention to this forest then what is going to happen this 80% of terrestrial wildlife which has impact on ecosystems and ecology in a very in a very complex manner this we cannot be in a position to predict and once we are not in a position to predict if we do not have forest at the core of our ideology or even approach then the climate change mitigation effort is not going to bear fruits for us and this is the first point that the author has highlighted in his entire journey the next important aspect is after the glasgow conference we have accepted zero net deforestation now when we talk about zero net deforestation it means that if in case we remove forest from a particular region or territory then it means that we will get new forest in the replacement of the forest that we remove but the kind of monoculture forest that humans will normally plant they are not going to be as effective as a natural forest in maintaining biological diversity and other features and hence if we do not take forest centric approach the zero net deforestation targets are not going to help us actually they will pull us back in terms of mitigation of climate change and this is the second important aspect that authors have highlighted that we should pay attention to third important aspect is the forest that we see today actually absorb 7.6 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide on an annual basis and this is a very significant proportion authors have also highlighted that this is something which is equivalent to 85 million cars producing all the carbon in their lifetime so when we look at the efficiency of the forest in terms of carbon fixation the ability of the forest cannot be matched by anything that we have done in the technological aspect and this is the third important aspect because of which authors highlight that we should have a forest centric approach the last that is the fourth aspect is the cooling effect of forest is an additional 0.5% now we are actually combating uh, climate change and global warming and whenever we talk about global warming we need technology or systems which can help us keep our planet cool and do not allow greenhouse gases to basically cause havoc now in this context 
the role of the forest is actually very high and this cooling effect can actually be further increased if we go in terms of going more for forest centric approach or promoting more forest so these are the basic four points which authors highlight in terms of why we should have a forest centric approach in cop 27 now when we look into this entire article this article is basically a suggestion to the agencies or institutions or the government in terms of what we can expect for future so while using this particular article from the perspective examination you can always prepare an article or a question which talks about what are the benefits of forest centric approach in order to combat climate change page number 11 of today's newspaper has a wonderful article that talks about the grandeur of chola empire one of the longest ruling dynasties in south india now this topic is important from the perspective of both mains as well as prelims and here our focus is also in the same direction now as far as prelims is concerned this will come under history of india and for gs paper one it will be part of art and culture of india for mains now in this context let's focus on few simple aspects about chola dynasty first and foremost the first mention of chola dynasty is in sangam text where they were considered as one of the three movnendras or kings now these three movnends that we talk about basically ruled the territory of tamil nadu and kerala and this was mentioned in the sangam literature now the people who were contemporaries to uh, chola that time were cher and pandyas one of the most well known ruler of sangam a chola was karikala and he was actually considered to be ancestor to later cholas that we are going to talk about in the coming few minutes now there is no mention of chola rulers after sangam era and they remained subordinates to pallavas in the kaveri region so this is what the first mention of cholas can be related to now cholas were actually uh, seen a reemergence and they are called as imperial chola or later chola or great chola now the reemergence of chola was actually started by vijayalaya in the phase of 852 871 ad here 850 AD is very important because this actually is the time period for the foundation of independent Chola kingdom that is in 850 AD. And the important aspect is that he built the city of Tanjore which is actually such a huge and beautiful city and he conquered territories till Kaveri Delta. Now Raj Rajwan and his son Rajendravan were the most prominent of the kings in the imperial Chola dynasty. When we talk about the Chola dynasty, the positions were transferred in the form of hereditary and kings were revered at par with the gods. So these are the basic things in terms of origin and emergence of Chola. Now let's focus on the geographical aspect. Now the early territory under the later Chola was that of Kaveri Delta and was known as Chola Mandalam. So this is actually an important aspect or fact that you must note. Later with military expansions, they conquered the entire Tamil Nadu region as we can see in the map here. Raj Raj 1 actually expanded, he was one of the first rulers who expanded the territory of Chola outside India and he was the one who conquered Sri Lanka in the north and eastern part. Rajendra 1, who was the successor of Raj Raj, he further expanded the Chola kingdom by expanding territories both northward as well as across the oceans. In the north, Rajendra I defeated western Chalukyas and expanded his northern boundary up to Tungabhadra river. Later, he brought the territory up to Godavari under his control. So first, he occupied territory till Tungabhadra and later, in the, in, the, in the many of the military expansion, he expanded his territory northwards towards the Godavari. Now, once he achieved success in terms of reaching to Godavari, he built Gangai Konda Cholapuram temple to commemorate his victory in the north of Tamil territory. Now in terms of naval expeditions, Chola had remarkable power in navy and navy warfare. They controlled both Koromandal that is Tamil Nadu and southern India coast along with Bay of Bengal and Malabar coast that is South Karnataka and entire Kerala coast. So their influence was actually in both these regions and this actually shows how powerful they were. It is also to their credit that they have captured the northern Sri Lanka and actually ruled it. Rajendra I even defeated and captured Sri Vijaya Kingdom or Southern Samatra and Kheda that is Khadaram, a feudatory of Sri Vijaya. 
so we can see that the territory expansion was towards ocean as well as towards north whenever we talk about chola dynasty we need to talk about uttar marir inscription which basically mentions the local bodies now when we talk about local bodies they were relatively autonomous local bodies and they were called as urars sabhyars nagarattars and nattar a brief understanding about these bodies is very important because nattars were actually assembly of land holders nattars basically discharge many administrative fiscal and judicial functions urar is basically a peasant settlement which is like workers and they were called as ur land holders of ur which is actually a peasant village acted as the members of the assembly of urar so this again is the aspect in terms of functioning of urar next is sabhyar now sabhyar was the local assembly uh, that looked into the affairs of brahmadeya or brahmins settlement now when you talk about brahmadeya we also need to understand that the land which was given to brahmin there was no tax collected on that so in a nutshell these territories which were donated to brahmins were tax free now coming back to sabhyars it was responsible for maintaining irrigation tanks attached to temple lands and other similar functions as urars and when we talk about that urars we know that they performed multiple functions next was nagarattars and when we talk about nagarattars we need to understand about nagram which was an urban center and settlement of traders and skilled artisans now nagarattars were assembly of residents of nagram and regulated their association with temples now during the reign of raj raj 1 mamallapuram was administered by a body called manangram there are more aspects about the chola dynasty in terms of religion their art and culture and other aspects which we have very well explained in the notes as well so it is our recommendation that please go through the notes so that you keep all these things handy for examination this news appears on page number 13 and it mentions about the intention of the government to amend the multi state cooperative societies act 2002 and the purpose is to ensure more democratic transparent and accountable functioning of the multi state cooperative societies in india and for this purpose the government is about to introduce the multi state cooperative societies amendment bill 2022 in the upcoming winter session of the parliament now the multi state cooperative societies act of 2002 was enacted based on the recommendations of mirdha committee which also suggested a model cooperative societies act and also the cooperative societies part was added in the constitution through the constitution 97th amendment and this amendment added part 9b in the constitution of india so here first of all let us understand the purpose and objectives to establish a cooperative society now the moment we talk about a cooperative society the picture of amul comes into our mind so in this regard cooperative societies are such organization where group of people come together and forms an organization and the whole idea to form this organization is to promote the economic interest of its members so here a voluntary group of people comes together forms an organization and the whole idea is to promote their economic interest of its members and based on this understanding of promotion of economic interest they also distribute certain part of the profit to its members after reserving certain part of the profit also and some of the other examples of cooperative societies are national cooperative land development banks federation limited national federation of state cooperative banks limited national cooperative union of india limited national agricultural cooperative marketing federation of india limited and other examples now there are certain cooperative societies which functions within a particular state and there are certain cooperative societies whose function extends to more than one state and accordingly the constitution of india defines multi state cooperative society as a society whose objects are not confined to one particular state so there are cooperative societies which are registered only within a state and there are multi state cooperative societies whose functions goes beyond one state and the constitution 97th amendment added part 9b which provided for article 243 zh to article 243 zt Now apart from part 9b the constitution 97th amendment also added the term cooperative societies as a part of article 19 1c that is to provide freedom to form association or unions 
or to form cooperative societies in the country and aspects related to cooperative society was also added under directive principles of state policy as article 43b which mentions about promotion of cooperative societies and it highlights four major aspects pertaining to the functioning of cooperative societies so it says that the state shall endeavor to promote voluntary formation of such cooperative societies their autonomous functioning democratic control and professional management of such cooperative societies so these four features becomes an essential features for the functioning of cooperative societies in india so based on the recommendation of mirda committee the multi state cooperative societies act was established which provides for the registration of multi state cooperative societies the functions of federal cooperative societies now this legislation explains federal cooperative societies as a federation of cooperative societies registered under this act and whose membership is available only to cooperative society or to a multi state cooperative society so this is the meaning of federal cooperative society hence the 2002 act of multi state cooperative societies also provides for functions of federal cooperative societies it provides for rights duties liabilities of its members also their disqualification and management of such multi state cooperative societies so the government intends to introduce amendment to this particular act and the whole idea to bring this amendment is to ensure more transparency and accountability in the functioning of multi state cooperative societies to improve ease of doing business of such multi state cooperative societies to reform the electoral process so that elections are held in free fair and timely manner and also to debar offenders for 3 years in order to bring in more electoral discipline so the idea is to reform the electoral process of the multi state cooperative societies as this has been one of the major concerns of non regular conduct of elections further the amendment aims to strengthen the monitoring mechanism along with ensuring financial discipline for the multi state cooperative societies further the amendment also aims to enable raising of funds for these multi state cooperative societies for their smooth functioning to provide for ombudsman for the multi state cooperatives as it will set up a mechanism to redress grievances of its members that to in a timely manner further the amendment intends to appoint a cooperative information officer who will ensure transparency within the functioning of multi state cooperatives by providing timely access to information and this will make the functioning of the multi state cooperatives more transparent and also accountable at the same time further the bill also intends to promote social inclusiveness and for this purpose it intends to add representation from women members of scheduled caste and also scheduled tribe to the board of multi state cooperative societies so this will ensure social inclusiveness within the board of such multi state cooperative societies and also to bring co opted directors having professional experiences in the field of banking management finance or having any other specialization especially regarding the functioning of multi state cooperative societies so these are some of the changes which the amendment intends to propose and in this direction the government also intends to bring a new national cooperative policy not only to address the various concerns and challenges of the functioning of multi state cooperative societies but also to make these multi state cooperative societies more transparent accountable and democratic in its functioning so on this note let us go through some of the challenges pertaining to the functioning of cooperative societies in india and also an important supreme court judgment pertaining to constitutional 97th amendment dealing with state cooperative societies so first of all regarding the concerns in the functioning of cooperative societies in india the first major concern can be said to be regional disparity now regional disparity here refers to the fact that cooperative development has been successful only in handful of states such as maharashtra gujarat karnataka etc and the support provided by the central government in the form of credit hence gets concentrated mostly in the states as the cooperative societies are more successful in the states as compared to other states so overall there is a need to focus on development of cooperatives in rest of the country or in other parts of the country 
where cooperatives are not so successful. So the government must focus on the success of the cooperative societies and its functioning in other parts of the country where it is not so much of a success. The other concerns pertaining to the functioning of cooperative is issue of membership both regarding the appointment of members and also their removal. So the basic concern is the inability of the cooperative to ensure active membership, to ensure speedy exit or removal of non-user members and there is also concerns regarding lack of communication and awareness building measures among the members of the cooperative society. The third challenge is pertaining to issues in governance of the cooperative societies because of serious inadequacies in the functioning of the board of the cooperative societies. The fourth set of concern is the fact that cooperative societies are not seen as an economic institution both by the policy makers and public at large and this overall affects the functioning of cooperative societies in rest of the India where it is not that much successful. The fifth concern highlighted is the inability to retain competent professionals and this overall leads to poor services and low productivity among the cooperatives. Another set of concern is lack of fundraising ability for cooperative societies, especially in those areas where it is not that much of a success. The next concern is politicization and excessive regulation by the government, which further constrains the functioning of the cooperative societies. The next concern is irregular holding of elections for the cooperative societies and this makes the office bearers to hold the office for an indefinite period and it also reduces their overall accountability towards its members. So regarding these concerns, a need was felt for fundamental reforms in the functioning of cooperatives to revitalize the institutions to ensure their contribution in economic development of the country to serve the interest of members and public at large and also ensure their autonomy, democratic functioning and professional management as has been prescribed under Article 43b of the Indian Constitution. Now let's take up another very important aspect regarding the state cooperatives. Now here the Supreme Court judgment with respect to Rajendra N. Shah case becomes important. Now we have already seen that the constitution 97th amendment added part 9b to the Indian constitution providing for cooperative societies. Now this constitutional amendment added article 243zh to 243zt. And these constitutional provisions provided for state cooperatives and also multi-state cooperatives and cooperatives in the union territories. Now the Supreme Court in the Rajendra N. Shah judgment declared provisions related to state cooperatives as unconstitutional. Now this was because according to the Supreme Court, state cooperatives has been provided under entry 32 of the state list and accordingly it is the state government which has the power to make law with respect to the state cooperatives. And since addition of state cooperatives within the constitution impacted the federal principles, hence this particular amendment must have been ratified by at least half of the state assemblies as has been provided under Article 368 Clause 2. So according to the Supreme Court, since this process provided under Article 368 Clause 2 was not followed, hence by applying the doctrine of severability. Supreme Court declared Article 243ZI to Article 243ZQ as unconstitutional since the process with respect to constitutional amendment under Article 368-2 was not followed. However, the Supreme Court held that provisions relating to multi-state cooperatives or cooperatives under union territories were very much constitutional as they do not form part of entry 32 of the state list. So this is an important judgment of the Supreme Court with respect to the cooperative societies in India and accordingly those provisions regarding the state cooperatives has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court by applying the doctrine of severability. Now this doctrine that is doctrine of severability was also applied in the Kyoto Holohan judgment whereby the Supreme Court declared paragraph 7 of the 10th schedule as unconstitutional as it refrained judicial review on the decisions of speaker or chairman regarding anti-defection. 
So by applying the doctrine of severability, certain parts of the constitution or any other law can be declared as unconstitutional if they violate any of the basic structure or any other important provisions of the constitution of India. So the Supreme Court judgment under Rajendra and Shah becomes important. Now similar judgment was provided by the High Court of Gujarat. However, the High Court judgment declared the entire cooperative society's part, that is the entire part 9b as unconstitutional. However, the Supreme Court has not declared the entire part 9b dealing with cooperatives as unconstitutional. Rather, only those parts has been declared as unconstitutional which deals with state cooperatives and this has been done by applying the doctrine of severability. Now, in the past two years, we have noticed that UPSC has started asking about case laws. So here the Supreme Court judgment pertaining to Rajendra and Shah regarding the Constitution 97th Amendment becomes very important. Thus, this article regarding multi-cooperative society becomes important from the perspective of GS Paper 2 under the section of Polity and Governance. Now, this news appears on page number 5 and this news is from the perspective of our prelims examination under the section of Environment. Now, this news highlights that Tamil Nadu government has notified India's first slender loris sanctuary and the Kadavur slender loris sanctuary is located in Karur and Dindingul district of Tamil Nadu and it is covered in around 11,000 hectares. Now if you look into the map of Tamil Nadu, this is the Dindigul district and this is the Karur district. So this sanctuary is spread across these two districts and covers approx an area of 11,800 hectares. Now talking about slender loris, they are small nocturnal mammals and are arboreal which means that they spend most of their time on the trees. Regarding their eating habits, so they eat insects and they are also known to eat leaves, flowers, slungs and also at times eggs of the birds. Slender loris acts as a biological predator of pest in agricultural crops and that's why it is beneficial for the farmers. So by eating the pest, it improves the agricultural productivity and yield and hence benefit the farmers. Now regarding their areas, they are commonly found in the tropical scrub and deciduous forest and also in the dense hedgerow plantations bordering farmlands of southern India and also Sri Lanka. Slender loris also faces threat from poachers due to misplaced belief that these animals have magical or medicinal powers and that's why their existence is also at threat and because of this, they have been categorized as endangered according to IUCN Red List. Further, they have also been given protection under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So placing this animal under Schedule 1 effectively prohibits its hunting. Further, the WWF India is also working to protect the habitats of slender loris through its wider conservation work which is done in the Western Ghats and also in the Nilgiris landscape. So these are some of the important highlights regarding slender loris and this topic particularly becomes important from the prelims perspective under the section of environment. Now this news also mentions about certain other important ecological development which has taken place in the state of Tamil Nadu. Now Tamil Nadu has notified India's first dugong conservation reserve in the Park Bay. It has also notified Kazuveli bird sanctuary in Vilupuram. As you can see in this map, this bird sanctuary is located just above Puducherry. Further, the state government has also notified Nanjarayan Lake Bird Sanctuary, which is in Tirupur in Tamil Nadu. And the Tamil Nadu government has also notified its fifth elephant reserve at Agast Malai. Now, if you look at the map, this is the area of Agast Malai Elephant Reserve and it falls into the state of Tamil Nadu and also in the state of Kerala. And the other four elephant reserves notified by the state government of Tamil Nadu are the Nilgiri Elephant Reserves, the Nilambur Silent Valley Coimbatore Elephant Reserve, Periyar Elephant Reserve and Anamalai Parambikulam Elephant Reserve. Now apart from this, Tamil Nadu also have three biosphere reserves and these three biosphere reserves located in Tamil Nadu are Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves, Gulf of Mannar Biosphere Reserve and Agastamalai Biosphere Reserve. 
Now look into this question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2019. The question was which of the following are in August Himalaya Biosphere Reserve? And UPSC had provided a list of wildlife sanctuary and reserves. So the August Himalaya Biosphere Reserve is located in the southernmost end of Western Ghats and covers an area of approx 3500 square kilometers. The August Himalaya Biosphere Reserve encompasses an area which falls under the Tirunel Valley and Kanyakumari districts of Tamil Nadu and also Tiruvananthapuram and Kollam districts of Kerala. And the reserves also includes three wildlife sanctuaries namely Shendurni, Peppara and Nayar and also the Kalakad Mundanthurai Tiger Reserve. Now if you look at the options all these have been provided under option A. Hence A was the correct answer with respect to this question asked in 2019. So these recent ecological developments taken place in Tamil Nadu becomes important along with the notification of Kedavur Slender Loris Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu. Let's take up this article appearing on page number 8 and this article highlights about war against illegal goods or smuggled goods which comes into India as it has an adverse effect on the Indian economy. Now this article says that because of increased inflation in the economy, it forces people to go for cheaper alternatives. And when we talk about cheaper alternatives, there are various inferior goods or goods of lower quality which is flooded in the market. Most of these goods are Chinese goods and the presence of these Chinese goods increases especially during festivals such as Diwali or even Holi. Apart from the flooding of inferior goods, mostly Chinese products, there are also other category of goods which is flooded in the market and these are the category of smuggled and illegal goods. So the article says that it is this category of goods which is more harmful because it not only impacts the revenue of the government because taxes are not paid but it also results in loss of jobs in a particular sector. So this article overall addresses the concerns with respect to flooding of smuggled and illegal goods in the market and also its adverse effect on the economy. So this topic gets covered under the section of Indian economy in GS paper 3. And this becomes the practice question for your mains. The question is highlight the adverse impact of a thriving market for illegal and smuggled goods on Indian economy. Suggest suitable measures for its mitigation. This question carries 10 marks and needs to be answered within 150 words. So let's try to focus our discussion based on this particular question. Now here there are two important reports which also has been highlighted in the article. These reports are regarding the Committee Against Smuggling and Counterfeiting Activities Destroying the Economy or Cascade. Now this report is published by FICI or Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. And this report has highlighted that the existence of illicit market in India is thriving basically in these five key sectors or five key industries. These are the industry of mobile phones, fast moving consumer goods, which is also referred as FMCG, of household and personal goods and FMCG for packaged foods, tobacco products and alcoholic beverages. Now according to the reports, the tobacco products and alcoholic beverages are strictly regulated by the government. Despite this fact, market is thriving with illegal and smuggled goods. So obviously there is a need for tighter regulation and enforcement of laws, particularly the tax laws and also laws pertaining to customs. The news also highlights about this particular index. Now this index is Global Illicit Trade Environment Index. This index is commissioned by Transnational Alliance to Combat Illicit Trade and it is produced by Economist Intelligence Unit that is EIU. Now this index has provided low rank to India in the first three category that is government policy, supply and demand and customs environment. Whereas in the aspect of transparency and trade, India ranks at 35. Now the objective of this index is to improve knowledge and understanding of regulatory environment and economic circumstances that supports or favors illicit trade. And the research findings are valuable for respective governments as it informs the government on the effectiveness of their efforts to fight illicit trade. 
it identifies areas or sectors which requires immediate attention with respect to the regulatory environment or with respect to regulating the illicit trade and it also encourages the government to strengthen their legislative and regulatory enforcement measures and it also provides companies and organizations with various tools and messages to raise awareness and mobilize resources against the practice of smuggled and illicit trade so as a part of your answer while highlighting about the thriving market for illegal and smuggled goods you can include both these reports that is the cascade report of fiki and also about the importance of global illicit trade environment index now some of the reasons for a thriving market of smuggled goods as suggested by the cascade committee of fiki is that india is the largest consumers market and india also have porous borders now this allows easy access to some of the smuggled products into the country another reason is that higher taxation in certain categories of goods or products encourages smuggling of those products further the report has also identified certain loopholes in the tax laws and also poor enforcement or implementation of these laws and also large scale export by chinese manufacturers so these are some of the reasons which has been suggested by the cascade committee for thriving smuggling market in india now coming to the main part of your answer it mentions about adverse impact of market thriving on smuggled and illegal products so the first adverse impact is of course the loss of revenue for the government in the form of tax duties and this article suggests that loss of revenue for the government accounts to around 58521 crores because of a thriving market for smuggled and illegal products and according to the report of cascade tax loss amounts to 49% particularly with respect to alcoholic beverages and tobacco companies so illegal and smuggled goods into these particular sectors accounts for tax loss of roughly 49% for the government so revenue loss becomes one of the major adverse impact of a thriving market for such smuggled goods the second reason is loss of legitimate employment mainly in these five sectors as has been highlighted by the cascade report and according to the report loss of job in the fmcg sector accounts for 68% and this loss of jobs is with respect to fmcg household and personal goods and also fmcg packaged foods and the third loss is for the company or the organization as it affects or impacts their brand value in the country and also results in revenue loss for that particular company so a bad market for such companies may force such company to exit the particular country or come out of the particular country with respect to their business so this is an overall loss for the government so all these are examples of adverse impact of market thriving on smuggled goods now the article has also suggested certain suggestions in order to counter a thriving market of smuggled goods the first reason highlighted is to rationalize tax especially for those products for which smuggling is very high now reduced tax will disallow smugglers to take advantage of greater price difference due to lower tax rates so suppose earlier the tax rate was 30% and because of this the price of the product was very high now say the government reduces this tax from 30% to say 12% so this will not only drive down the cost which means it will make the product less expensive and decline in price will make the product easily available in the market and more people can afford that particular product and since this product will be easily affordable hence its smuggling will reduce so reduced tax in certain high smuggling products will disallow smugglers to take advantage of of the greater price difference the second suggestion is to aggressively promote local industry to build world class brands and also products and this will also reduce dependence on international manufacturers the third suggestion is to rationalize tax for different products for which smuggling is very high and also provide incentives to the local industries as it will ensure mass manufacturing of products and this will also discourage smuggling of such products and it will also disincentivize sale of cheap foreign goods the next set of suggestion is to allow global brands to manufacture in india provided they fulfill certain conditions 
that they offer India specific pricing for such products so that these products becomes affordable in the Indian market. These global brands are not allowed to take away royalties or profits outside India which they have earned by selling their products in India and also allow MNCs to repatriate profits earned from goods which they sell from outside India. So these are the conditions which has been suggested in this article. The next point highlighted is use of cutting edge technology to ensure strict enforcement. So it says that technology such as artificial intelligence, blockchain and location technology can help in increasing the seizure of illegal goods. And the government also need to increase awareness among consumers against the adverse impact of use of these smuggled and illegal goods on Indian economy. And based on this consumer awareness, it is expected that consumers boycott such smuggled goods. So these are some of the suggestions in order to counter a thriving market for smuggled and illegal goods. So I hope after our discussion, you will be able to write the answer to this particular question. With this, we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you for watching DNS.